Okay, welcome everyone to this sixth panel. I uh, hope that you are learning a lot today uh, and you're going to learn a lot more on this panel. We have a great uh, a group of people here and the theme is grid, storage, and transmission. So we're going to kick it off starting with Bill White, who is the Director of Public Affairs for CTC Global. And you can just talk from there if you want. Just make sure the microphone. Okay. All right, everybody can hear me, get this in the right position. Great. Hi, I'm Bill White. I'm a Director of Public Affairs at CTC Global Corporation, and thanks everybody for coming and for your interest in uh, uh, transmission and storage and energy and clean energy. We're really excited to be here today. Uh, so I'm going to talk just for a few minutes about uh, advanced high-performance transmission conductors. Uh, and that's a fancy word for conductors, a fancy word for wire. So for high voltage cable, we call them high voltage conductors, and that's wire. And I'm gonna talk specifically about, about this product. So people in this group, I'm sure, uh, have spent a lot of time uh, you know, thinking about and, and studying energy innovation over the last several years. We've seen tremendous innovation at the end user level with high efficiency products like LED lighting and lots of end use, great end use technologies to manage your energy. We've seen great new generation technologies and the prices fall and we've seen a lot of innovation. It turns out there's a tremendous amount of innovation also going on in the middle, in the transmission system, in the grid. And that's what I wanna talk about, in particular one product, but there are many, but this is our product and I wanna talk about it. So for the last 100 plus years, uh, the high voltage system uh, has used wires that have a steel core wrapped with round aluminum strands. Uh, and that type of wire is, mo almost all of the high voltage wire in this country is that type of wire. This is uh, a new product that uses a carbon fiber composite core. It uses these trapezoidal uh, strands, you can't see it from that distance, but I encourage you to come to our table next door and take a look. Uh, and it means what it adds up to is for the same diameter and weight, we can conduct twice as much electricity. It's more efficient. It cuts the line losses by 25 to 40 percent. So that's a gross savings of one to two percent, generally speaking. Uh, and it is stronger and lighter than steel. It doesn't sag uh, and it doesn't corrode and it doesn't rust. Uh, and so we think it's a really great innovation and we need to get the most out of our grid to get more renewables online, uh, to balance them over large regions, uh, and we need to be as efficient as we can be with our existing system and with any new lines we build. And that's why we think that high performance conductor products like this are the ones that we should be using going forward. And we're really happy today to tell you that in Texas, uh, American Electric Power just won an Edison Award from the Ele Edison Electric Institute, their highest award just last month, it was announced. Uh, they used our product to reconductor, that is replace the wire on a 120 mile stretch uh, in the lower Rio Grande Valley of a 345 KV line, which is an extra high voltage line, a very high voltage line. Uh, they did it, they didn't have to replace the towers, they used the existing towers uh, they doubled the capacity of the line. They cut their line losses by over 30%. Uh, they eliminated their uh, uh, risks and reliability concerns due to line sag. Uh, and they did it all without taking the line out of service. Because they could use the same size conductor and double the capacity, they didn't have to replace the towers. So it is the largest energized reconductor project in history. Uh, and so we're really proud to have been a part of that. And uh, what it means for uh, going forward is, you know, we're excited that we need to modernize our grid and we think technologies like ours are gonna be a big part of that. And it's, it's a, not a part people hear about all the time. We're familiar with the end use products. We see the generation technologies and that's why I wanna share this with you today. And we're happy to answer any questions you might have. And uh, we sell this product now, we've had it for 10 years. It's sold in 40 countries around the world. Uh, we manufacture it in Irvine, California, uh, right here in the US. Uh, and uh, you know, now we're 
selling it in, we sell it, like I said, 150 utilities, 40 countries, uh, and uh, growing all the time. So we're excited to be here and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And that's really exciting, too, because when we think about the scale of transmission losses in this country, when you get savings like that, that's the equivalent of a whole bunch of power plants. So that is something we really, really need to think about. Um, and it's another whole way that renewables and efficiency really go hand in hand and are extremely important in terms of powering this country, right? So we're now going to turn to Keith Dennis, who is a senior principal for End Use Solutions and Standards with NRECA, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. And Keith knows a lot about dealing with transmission, efficiency, and renewables. That's true. Um, I'm going to talk about two things mainly today. Um, and if you remember two things, the concept of environmentally beneficial electrification and the concept of community storage. Um, like, like Carol said, I work for the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. Uh, we're the representation of 900 not-for-profit electric utilities around the country. So overall, co-ops cover about three-quarters of the landmass of the United States. We serve uh, 42 million people in 47 states. Um, so I do want to talk about these two concepts, and first is environmentally beneficial electrification. And, and that has to deal with, you know, what is electricity's role in a carbon-constrained future? And what are the implications of a, a cleaner and greener grid and the changes to the reputation of electricity as it becomes uh, more renewables and, and uh, reduce it, uh, produces less greenhouse gas emissions? Um, for decades, policymakers have considered that if you could have things in your house that directly burn fossil fuel like natural gas or propane, uh, that that might be an environmentally preferable option to using electricity from the grid because the grid uh, had uh, technology like coal and, and, and gas power plants. Uh, however, the industry has gone uh, under, undertaken a lot of change in the last uh, decade, and that conventional wisdom really uh, needs to start changing. Um, so it, it's been about a century since we brought power to, to homes across the country, and now it's really uh, environmental groups and uh, industry stakeholders who are saying that part of the greenhouse gas uh, future is actually electrifying more things, like electrifying transportation we heard about in the last section. Uh, electrifying uh, space heating in your house and electrifying uh, water heating instead of using uh, propane and natural gas. Uh, and there's, there's several reasons why, big, tr big, big trends. Um, the first trend is uh, that the end use appliances in our homes and businesses today are more efficient than ever. Uh, we have heat pump technology uh, to, to heat your home and heat your water that's 200% efficient, ge uh, geothermal, uh, systems are up to 400 percent efficient. They take heat out of the air and the ground and turn it into to, to heat for your, for your house. Uh, if you think about just light bulbs, you, you're not even going to be able to buy a CFL light bulb anymore, just LED light bulbs. So you think on the side of how much electricity you're using in these devices, it's going down, 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 down. Uh, so, so if you're saying, you know, how am I going to heat my water, how am I going to heat my house, you're going to have an appliance that's extremely efficient. Now on the other side of the equation, besides also this, you know, putting them through wires that are uh, incredibly efficient, you have the generation, and the emissions with generation is going down, down, down as well. Um, almost all new power plants are either combined cycle gas or renewables, and a lot of them are renewables. Uh, the power plants are extremely efficient, and the less efficient power plants are being taken offline as all these renewables are coming in. Obviously renewables don't have any greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's also the need to integrate renewable resources. Uh, traditionally speaking, if you know, a house wanted electricity, we would build a power plant, we would burn gas, we'd burn coal, we'd produce as much electricity as you wanted whenever you wanted it. Now we're using things like wind and the sun, and that's only available when nature says it's available. Um, and so the wind's blowing, the sun's shining, we have to use the electricity generated when it's available, and electric appliances are the only way to do that. And they also can be used in a way that takes advantage of those resources. So you can heat water, for example, in your water heater when the sun's shining, and then not heat it when, when the sun's gone, and it will be in your tank still warm. You can uh, put that electricity in your vehicle at night when the wind's blowing, and then drive during the day. Uh, you can time 
when you use these products to when it, the nature has it uh, be available. Uh, and, and just more and more cases, uh, the, the last trend is that um, there are more times when you have the option to switch to electricity than, than ever before. Uh, there are electric vehicles out there. You can reduce your, your, um, your gasoline, your diesel. Uh, there are pumps for agriculture, uh, so you don't have to use diesel in your pumps. Uh, and, and again, there's heat pump technology for your water heating and your space heating. So all those things make environmentally beneficial uh, electrification an important part of our, our future. The, 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 the next thing I want to talk about is the idea of community storage. And that everybody talks about you know, storage being really important to renewable uh, energy. And we have things out within our community that actually store energy, like water heaters, like vehicles, uh, and sometimes even like batteries uh, in people's homes or on the grid. Uh, so throughout your community, there's all sorts of resources out there, and a lot of them are cost effective today, and we use a lot of them today. We use water heaters for demand response already, We can use, uh, and that's using them for storage. And so we're talking about it in terms of community storage. And folks have heard of community solar before, and it's the idea that maybe you can't put a solar panel on your house or, or you don't want to, but you can buy into a community solar project down the street. In the same way, you might not be able to solve the storage problem yourself, but you can participate in a community storage project by using your car to charge and, and help bring down the, the peak use of the grid or to store energy when it's cheap and available, like wind at night. Uh, so water heaters are a big part of that. Um, uh, vehicles, ice storage, batteries, all that stuff might be available in your house that you can participate in a community storage program. Um, so. Uh, with that, I'll just say uh, electricity is, is a very important part of solving the climate picture. Uh, the trends are that we need to electrify more things, get rid of uh, things that directly uh, combust fossil fuel in your home, and, uh, and we hope to, that you will have the opportunity to participate in community storage uh, programs in the future. Thanks. Thanks, Keith. We'll now turn to Brett Adams, who is a Vice President for Business Development, Sales, and Marketing with Primus Power. Brett. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have to apologize in advance because I think this is the first time I've been required to sit, um, not be allowed to hold or point or demonstrate anything or use slides, so I'm really winging it here outside of my comfort zone. Um, you want to stand up over here? No, no. I, I, want to be, I, want to come, I can do this. It's outside of my comfort zone. It's a learning experience. <laughs> Um, so basically, I, I feel like I represent energy storage. Um, it's amazing, you know, depending on which, where you're at and which sort of uh, uh, communities you step into, what the available knowledge is. Usually for most of us, energy storage is that part of your car, your cell phone, your computer that you hate, that causes you pain and suffering. Um, and I'm, I'm here to say that it can be something else, um, kind of already been addressed. Uh, energy storage is about enabling policy goals like using uh, more renewables, uh, making renewables dispatchable, about being able to use the grid more efficiently to begin with. So being able to use fossil fuels and the current infrastructure and produce more electricity and use it more efficiently. Um, and grid resilience. It's about not being in the dark just because a large hurricane came by. Uh, and so uh, needless to say, uh, due to a number of policies that I'll kind of cover, uh, the energy storage market has really taken off. Um, where I used to have to do a long song and dance six years ago when I started getting involved in it, it's pretty well understood now. And we're seeing, uh, say, uh, it was under 100 million when the company was formed uh, in 2009. Uh, there's, uh, in 2015, it passed 500 million, and we look like we're gonna be over a billion dollars um, uh, this year and growing three billion in the next four to five years. Uh, there's less than two gigawatts of stationary storage installed today. Uh, that it looks to be expanding to over 25 gigawatts in the next 10 years. So huge expansion, uh, quite diversified. This is just not us nuts in California uh, that are driving this. Actually, we're not even the leader in per capita. This is being driven nationally and globally. Um, Hawaii is being driven because of large penetration of solar is causing issues uh, such as reverse flows through substations. Uh, New York, due to resiliency, things like Katrina. Uh, Texas, due to the large amounts of renewables, the wind that's been installed, uh, and California uh, for a number of reasons, including uh, resiliency and integration of a large amount of solar. Uh, so it's happening globally. 
um, and it's, we're really at the very beginning of this. Um, it's going to be a very large market, uh, but you're really seeing the results of positive policies um, coming to play. The performance are improving significantly. The costs have come down uh, probably 70 percent in the last two years. Uh, so something that was always um, previously stated as a question of uh, cost and performance were not there is now really just about having a level playing field. Um, so there's a large number of drivers for that and I invite people to come by and I'll happily have a conversation. Um, I'm in the B7. Um, a little bit on, on Primus Power. Uh, we benefited in 2009. We were an ARPA-E uh, funded project to develop our core technology. We did DOE demonstration project. We recently did a uh, major contributor to the components to an ESTCP microgrid. Um, so this positive sort of policy has helped us and we've performed and brought interesting technology. Our, our primary benefit is that it's very long duration, five hour systems, last forever. That unlike conventional batteries, we don't wear out due to depth of discharge. We don't uh, get, do any damage to the system due to the state of charge system. So it's a much more resilient battery. And so you would love to have us on, our, on your bat, on your PC and have our battery wear out, except that it literally weighs a ton because it's mostly made out of water. So we're great for stationary storage, horrible for electric vehicles um, for that reason. Um, we shipped a number of systems. Our first system was last year, megawatt hour system in California. Since then, we've shipped a system uh, to Washington, to Microsoft. Uh, we recently was announced by Microsoft, uh, to Central Asia supporting uh, a solar installation um, and other systems in California. And we are fully sold out in 2016 and we have a number of projects that we're doing in 2017. So um, why come to DC? You know, my main message at this point is that the performance is doing pretty well the costs are coming down, and there's some really interesting and innovative technologies that are underway, we'll see, um, if there's any shortcomings in the current technology. So that's where, where we play. And so what I want first and foremost in terms of, you know, we're creating American jobs, 60% of our product is, uh, the so value comes from California, the other 20% from, another 20% from the U.S. broadly. Um, you know, I'm happily employed in lots of smart people in Hayward. Um, what we need most, and for, first and foremost, is a level playing field. We need the chance to be considered every single time there's a transmission project, every single time that there's a capacity, that there be a requirement to at least consider energy storage and let us give a chance to make a bid. Um, there's been a number of orders by FERC 755, uh, FERC Order 755, for example, that showed the benefit. If we get paid for the benefit we bring, we can create a market. Um, and so the studies and mandate that, that FERC is now talking about where they would at least uh, look and understand the barriers uh, that exist for energy storage. We find that very positive because I think if you actually look at the situation, you will, in many cases, not in every application, but you'll find many applications where energy storage is cost effective and uh, valuable to the grid today. And so we just ask for that kind of consideration. Um, and, you know, if we could have the similar sort of um, cons uh, Financial opportunities, that's always been our problem we, um, that other energy projects get, like um, uh, MLP, Master, Master Limited Partnerships, to lower our financing costs. ITC would be nice, which I know is being introduced this week um, at the Senate. Um, these are definitely nice to have, would make it easier for us to fund in projects and get the experience we need to drive the scale up to get the cost, and perform, cost down performance up. Um, and again, really, uh, like Arizona now requires that every energy storage project or every um, uh, purchase of new capacity, consider energy storage. Other, other states have done uh, similar things. Uh, so in summary, you know, energy storage is really happening. Um, companies like Primus Power, I think, you know, we, we've benefited from policy, but we've delivered we, really to the desire of those policies. So there's a lot of fun and cool stuff happening, um, but it, you don't have to wait. There are projects underway today, the market is really happening, and real benefits in terms of resiliency, um, more efficiency, which reduces greenhouse gases, and the enablement of more wind and solar is happening today. And happy to talk more about that to anybody who comes by my table. Thanks very much, Brett. Uh, we'll now turn to Mike Jacobs, who is the uh, Senior Energy Analyst with the UCS, the Union of Concerned Scientists. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming out. Uh, the folks at EESI also do a great job all year round with uh, focus briefings here. So this policy forum gives each of us speakers eight minutes 
which my wife reminded me was the length of our first date. Is anyone here familiar with speed dating? So I'd like to see if after this conversation we might want to see each other again. In Boston 8 Minute Dating, we were given the option to meet again for business or for romance. Obviously, I'm here for the networking relationship. But about me, I work for a public interest organization. We have a vision of making our electric grid run on 100% renewable energy. To do this, society needs both wires and storage. Right now, the U.S. is about 7% renewables or 13% including hydropower. I first got involved with storage while working in the private sector to add more wind farms to Hawaii's island electric grids. Yes, Hawaii, land of affection and compassion, they call it aloha, though I was based in Boston. Uh, in addition to all the great things about Hawaii, one sees the limits of an island when working on problems there. Uh, for example, the electric grid on an island is much, much smaller than the grids we have in the lower 48 states. But this can be a reminder that we ultimately have limits everywhere in everything we do. But to add more uh, than that first wind farm on Maui, on the island of Maui, um, which at night was already sometimes 30% of the electricity used at night, we needed one of two things, either, either a transmission line, a new transmission line, uh, which is how all grids make use of wind farms, or energy storage. In Hawaii, such a transmission line would have to be underwater, going from one volcanic island to the next, which is especially difficult and has not been done in such deep water. The other option, uh, which at that time was not known as practical matter, was storage. People would say to us, you could get a battery. Like they would say, you could win the lottery. So uh, no one in the renewable energy industry at that time was building energy storage. Uh, of course, this is starting to change now. But uh, much like with dating, we might have an idea of what would be perfect. In Hawaii, adequate transmission would have been perfect for what we needed at the time. But you know, even that might not be available. So um, in the experience in Hawaii, we actually used storage to fix a transmission problem. The other interesting thing about dating, I mean, getting to know storage, um, is that there's a lot of mystery. It can be hard to get to know storage. The storage characters can play many roles, can seem to be something different to different people. For me, I've been worried about trust and safety issues. It is difficult to know what to expect and what health and safety measures have been addressed when dealing with energy storage. So in the policy realm, more testing, more standardization of performance, uh, more sort of safety clarifications and standards will help a great deal for wider adoption of energy storage. And we've been working on the Senate bill uh, literally with that kind of language. The other mystery, though, is much more exciting. This, uh, there are so many ways that storage and transmission improve the grid, and not all these benefits have a price or payment. That is, there are benefits from storage that are not easily monetized. Sometimes people have looked at storage and will ask, what is it? Is it a generator? Is it part of transmission? This confused introduction for storage into a world where everybody knows who they are, who they work for, and how they get paid is definitely holding back the adoption of energy storage. So this is where you come in. Public policy can help recognize when there are benefits to society from less air pollution for store, coming from storage use, for lower prices for consumers, for fewer conflicts about siting new infrastructure. Energy storage brings some benefits that reduce expenses, reduce air pollution, but which do not get a payment. So these are public benefits. They are a reason for public support through legislation, as Brad has named, to support energy storage or through tax policy changes that explicitly support storage. So uh, we've got a little bit of literature, basically, thank you, Sarah, um, some blogs we've written explicitly about coming through some of the obstacles for storage. We've got those as handouts, and I thank you. Great, thank you, Mike. And so I think the moral of the story is we should all take our speed dating into the other room as well. I don't know. <laughs> um, but. Uh, 
I think this now brings us back to thinking about transmission and as Mike was just saying, the whole connection in terms of thinking about storage and transmission all being important as we look at building in more and more renewables. And so I now am pleased to turn to Jim Hecker, who is the Wires Council. Uh, he is with Hush and Blackwell, and he is also the for, a former chairman of FERC of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Jim. Uh, thanks, Carol. Um, uh, we just love working with EESI and uh, and participate in this conference every year. Uh, it's, um, it's interesting if you listen to some of the uh, policymakers, senators, and congressmen today um, talk about all the bright and shiny new technologies and techniques uh, that this uh, sustainable energy conference represents, that none of them say transmission. And that's because, you know, it's thought of as old technologies, a lot of stuff in the air, the aluminum sky, as some people call it. Um, uh, well, I submit to you um, um, uh, that uh, we uh, need more of it. It needs to be better planned. It needs to be infused with new technologies. Uh, and uh, it needs to be planned in a way that complements a lot of the things that we've been talking about on this panel. Um, it's uh, it's an important ingredient of our energy future, uh, and it's one that uh, people uh, sometimes uh, talk about reluctantly because it, uh, it has uh, historically had a bad rap. Uh, it's old technology, it's costly, uh, and so what's happened uh, after 1980, uh, frankly, the country disinvested in transmission uh, until about 2005. We, uh, we uh, witnessed a decline in investment, a deterioration of, uh, of the high voltage uh, uh, grid at a time when the uh, electric system uh, and the economy were just beginning to become transformed into something we have today. Uh, competitive bulk power markets fostered by FERC, uh, new technologies, digital technologies. I mean, most of what we've talked about in this panel today uh, wouldn't have been on anybody's radar screen 20 years ago. Um, uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, of course, uh, more renewable energy and as capital costs come down and the costs of producing uh, wind power and solar biomass power, uh, uh, there's more of it and it uh, completely transforms the nature of the whole electric system and how it operates. Um, and so you have tr a transmission system that was built in the 1950s and 60s that we are now asking to do things that it wasn't designed to do. That's where new investment comes in. We, we, uh, we think that uh, uh, it's been projected that between now and 2035 or 2040, the country is going to have to invest somewhere around two trillion dollars in the electric system as a whole. That's a, that's a lot to choke down. Uh, transmission, ironically, is uh, only a minor part of that, uh, 300 billion or so. Um, but uh, a lot of that has uh, been spent over the last few years and we're, we're now on a very positive uh, investment uh, curve. Uh, <clears throat> but in anticipation of what the economy is going to need and what renewable energy technologies are going to be available and marketable and competitive in the future. Uh, all of that necessitates a way of planning transmission, of anticipating um, what our needs are going to be and building transmission, uh, which frankly lasts 50 years or so. Uh, that, um, that is going to, to ease our transition into a clean energy economy. Why is that not inevitable? Well, frankly, today transmission is planned uh, the way it's always been planned, uh, usually by, uh, for reliability purposes in very incremental pieces uh, and, uh, and built uh, to 
uh, stay under regulators' radar screens because it is expensive and people think most about the cost. Um, and uh, uh, the fact is, there are two things I want to leave with you. Number one is that, uh, as uh, I believe, uh, I believe uh, Congressman Van Hollen said today, um, in talking about this general context, a uh, cost is the wrong way to come at this. Uh, what we need to be thinking about is value. Uh, and we need to be planning transmission uh, for the kinds of technologies that, that these gentlemen see coming online. We need to be investing in the kinds of technologies that Bill talked about, uh, not, because, uh, not because it's just a great thing to do to pump up rate base, but because in the long run the benefits to consumers are enormous. We've, done a, we've asked the Brattle Group, some of you may know them, and we have copies of this uh, back, at, uh, back at the office over here, uh, to do a study as to what uh, this kind of anticipatory, proactive as opposed to reactive transmission planning can be, uh, can yield in a very carbon constrained environment, which I think is what we're all talking about today. Uh, whether it's driven by the clean power plan of EPA, whether it's just the, uh, the economic degradation of, of traditional baseload generation, uh, whether it's driven by new technologies, whatever, uh, we, are, we are looking at uh, trying to plan for a grid that, uh, that does a lot of things very differently. The savings to consumers they anticipate uh, in a more carbon-constrained environment, such as the one anticipated by EPA, uh, is about $50 billion a year uh, from, uh, from investment in transmission. There will be, of course, not anywhere near that. So the, the yield to the American economy and to the American electricity consumer is enormous. So focusing on near-term costs and, uh, and having a regulatory system that in the near term is very, very tough to deal with. Uh, is, uh, is problematic. Let's look long term, let's look at value, let's look at ways in which the, uh, a, a very integrated uh, and up-to-date uh, electric transmission system can complement and help the deployment of these kinds of new technologies and the clean energy economy generally. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Jim. We have a couple minutes, so if there are any questions for our panel. Okay, right here. Go ahead, Tim. Um, I was wondering what have been the major factors driving the reduction in cost and storage? Mainly scale. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, mainly scale. So, so basically, the, there's a, a, a large number of the components in conventional technology that when made on very large scale, the graphite components, ionic membrane materials, and so forth, can be much, much cheaper, the level of automation and so on. Um, in our particular technology, um, you know, we're already, our costs are fairly low. We're actually at par with conventional lithium ion, even though we're at tiny scale. And so if we could have, uh, in some of the components, the cost would drop 50, 80 percent just because we could use uh, more automation, uh, we could design facilities that are specialized in producing what are right now very, very custom, and so on. Okay, you're first in the back there. Okay. I'm curious, um, the last presenter, what changes in the regulatory environment would you see to shift <laughs> from a defensive uh, more, to a more innovative future? Well, I, you know, I think we need to, to in, incent new technologies like the one that Bill's talking about, and, and uh, uh, Congress actually did that in 2005 and provided some incentives uh, uh, that have helped uh, uh, the resurgent and transmission in investment. Um, but I can tell you uh, what the problems are, and you can infer, infer from that what the solutions are. And they're very tough solutions 
that are legislatively extremely difficult. But uh, the Supreme Court has said in, um, in New York versus FERC that FERC has plenary jurisdiction over electric transmission because it's interstate commerce. Uh, what FERC does is uh, set the rates and it has jurisdiction over planning under some subsequent cases. Uh, but it does not approve individual transmission projects. It does not cite those projects. That's done by the states. Uh, it does not have anything to do with the rights of way or land rights. It doesn't have anything like the authority over transmission lines that it does over the, uh, the planning and construction of natural gas pipelines. Uh, and so one can infer from that that the ultimate regulatory solution is to make a transmission regulation, since it's an energy delivery system like pipelines, to make that regulatory system look more like pipeline regulation. Um, that would really require a complete rethink of, uh, of how the Federal Power Act was written in 1935 and uh, in uh, a Congress that's very hesitant to preempt anything uh, uh, at the state level. I, it, I don't see it happening. But there are lots of things you can do to improve siting to get state regulators and, uh, and federal regulators on the same, uh, uh, on the same uh, page in terms of the need for transmission and the need to work together. Because remember transmission, where it used to be a local event within one state, within one service territory is now a multi-state, multi-regional development project. And that means you've got a whole lot of people with different laws and different criteria and different ways of looking at who pays um, to, uh, to, to get involved in, in these things. It's one reason that FERC's Order 1000 has not worked particularly well when it comes to inter-regional planning, uh, inter-regional projects. Um, that's, that's my short answer. I can give you the longer one some, some other week. <laughs> okay, and so we'll take, if you can make it really short. Um, how open um, would you guys be to, or, or like what value do you find in building an underground electricity highway where renewable energy can be easily transported from say Arizona to um, a, a more cloudy region like Maine for example? What value do you find? Would you find a lot of value in that? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll wait into that. Um, well, I think the idea of, of, of a national and interregional network is a great idea. And I think in fits and starts, we are moving in that direction uh, because the economics are so overwhelmingly beneficial, as you point out. Uh, when the sun's shining and providing really cheap solar in Arizona, if you can move that power east and pretty far east, the the differential is is enormous in the price, right? I mean, you're paying very high prices on the east coast, and you're generating this power for a tiny fraction of that. And uh, so, I think that makes sense. Whether you know the cost of undergrounding lines, or even whether you even need to do that with technologies like these and many other technologies that are now available. Uh, even with the existing overhead system and the existing rights of way that we have, uh, you can get a lot more out of the system. Uh, there are some, you know, DC lines proposed, DC networks have been proposed. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we'd like to see that and, you know, we'd like to see more of that. I think it, it's a very cost effective way. There are a number of studies that tell us that a strong network is one of the least cost ways to decarbonize our economy. Uh, and one of the fastest ways, the technology is all here right now. We don't have to invent anything at all. Uh, and, and so that's very compelling. And I, I just want to add one more thing when we talk about the cost of transmission. According to EIA at DOE, you know, the smallest part of your electric bill is transmission. It's about 11%. About two-thirds of it is generation, and then the rest is the distribution network. So, yes, individual transmission projects are expensive. But there is no greater value than upgrading the network. I mean, think of any network, the internet or broadband. You know, is anybody suggesting 
well, we have too much. Let's just, we're just getting way too much information. It's coming too fast. Let's just shut that down. No, I mean, it is a high value. We need to do it smartly and we need to pick, you know, find the places where the highest value is going to be there and do it in the lowest impact way that we can, of course. But, uh, but I think there's a tremendous value left there and we really need it. As Jim said, with the future that we're headed toward with a lot less carbon in the system. So. Well, I want to thank a terrific panel.